There we go. So welcome to day three. Uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, kind of an introduction to HCC and what resources we provide here at HCC. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to load different software modules and how to start jobs on our resources. Next week on the 28th, we're going to talk about uh, how to use different software packages a little bit more, how to use Anaconda, and how to really take advantage of that, as well as some of the other services that we do offer. Uh, our learning objectives for today, we're not going to really need to talk about connecting to HCC clusters too much. Uh, mostly because we've been doing that already for the past two weeks. We're going to be looking at transferring files to and from the cluster a little bit more, as well as using some software, submitting some jobs. Uh, that's kind of why we use high performance computers is to take advantage of them. And then we're also going to talk about some best practices and some workflow development tips as well. This is just to kind of help get the most out of the resources that, excuse me, that we do offer. Uh, some references that we do have for today, and I'll actually go ahead and see if I can quickly steal this link as well. Nope, and there we go. Slides are not behaving right. So I'll go ahead and even copy our job examples link and post it in the chat. Uh, this is a repository we're actually going to be using today throughout the workshop. Uh, and we'll actually do a demo of it here in a bit. Uh, some other links available is our workshop page that's been posted into chat earlier today as well. Uh, we also have our documentation page, which has been developed over the last decade or so, which has a lot of great resources on how to use different aspects of our clusters, including specific uh, applications and different fields. So if we've ever had a question come through our tickets and it's been a, how do I do this one very fancy thing with a certain application? More often than not, we do have that question answered in our documentation, just so that way others can take advantage of that. And if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to reach out to us at our support email at hccsupport at unl.edu, or joining our open office hours every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. over Zoom. And to kind of talk about what our big bang is about uh, supercomputing is that high performance Computing is essentially the refer, uh, refers to the practice of aggregating computing power in a way that delivers a much higher performance than what you could get out of, say, your desktop, laptop, or workstation to solve problems of any size in many different fields. So commonly we see in science and engineering is where a lot of different supercomputing facilities see the biggest usage out of it. Though here at the University of Nebraska, we see a lot of the humanities and arts are starting to especially pick up. Uh, we have some research with the College of Education and Human Sciences, for example, looking into language evolution from the American Civil War, look at the linguistics of teaching. We have a lot of work coming from the Johnny Carson uh, Center of Emerging Arts. We have a lot of classes here on city campus using uh, GP resources for classes. It's it's actually getting really hard to track of all the different research projects going on. And that's really exciting to see all of what's actually happening. And so we talked about how HPC or high performance computing is essentially aggregation of a whole lot of resources. And so the general idea of what a computing cluster is, is we have many different parts working together, similar to how your own desktop or laptop work together. And so what we've already been using for the past few days or past two days of our workshop has been the login node, which is the primary interface for everyone who uses that supercomputer will use. And this essentially allows you to manage files, run very basic scripts, nothing more intensive than maybe searching for a file or using a text editor. Um, this is also where you submit your jobs from as a interface. You have a management node or management computer or head node. It goes by many terms. This is essentially the one computer or multiple computers even that manage what a cluster is doing at that point in time. It's also what handles distributing the jobs out to the cluster itself to run. Uh, only system administrators will have access to this node. And that's just as a security perspective and to help keep the cluster running as optimally as possible. There's the worker nodes where Crane has about 460 
and Swan has about 168 worker nodes. And these are the main powerhouse of the supercomputer or cluster itself. And these are where your workflows will actually run themselves. And then finally, there's the storage array, which is equivalent to, say, your hard drive or solid state drive in your laptop or desktop. And this is where all of your data is stored. Uh, Crane has about 1.2, no, 1.4 petabytes or 1,400 terabytes. And Swan has 5,200 terabytes for their storage arrays, as well as sharing a 1.5 petabyte storage array called Common that we'll talk about here in a second. And so quite a lot of storage. Every group has about or, uh, 80 terabytes for free to use on HCC resources right off the bat, which is a great opportunity for many people. And so here's some examples that we have of either clusters we currently operate or have operated in the past. So on the left side is the red supercomputer, which is owned and operated by the CMS project in Switzerland. Uh, this is actually living here at UNL under the stadium. It is a, I want to say it's about 700 nodes in total with about 16,000 cores. It's actually one of the old, oldest and longest running clusters at HCC itself. Uh, it's actually in the old athletics recovery area for the Huskers football team, which is a nice little piece of history. Uh, then in the upper right hand side is a very old cluster we used to run called Bug Eater, where a lot of the administration was done initially from those terminals on the Baker's rack. And then does anyone recognize what's on the bottom right hand side by chance? Feel free to speak up or post it in chat. So these are some Raspberry Pis. Uh, they're the first generation Raspberry Pis uh, from almost a decade ago. And we use them to teach a supercomputing class uh, back in 2015 or 2016-ish. Because when we originally taught it, we were using old servers from a cluster we called Firefly. And this was from back in 2007. Servers are loud and very hot and very hard to move around. Um, I think one of our demo clusters we used for that class was about a thousand watts of power. The Raspberry Pi, especially back then, was only about, excuse me, about five watts. They don't have any moving parts to make noise. Those are about the size of a credit card, so you can easily carry a whole bucket of them without having to worry too much. And they still run the same operating system that we run on our clusters themselves. So they make a very ideal candidate for teaching the concepts of supercomputing without any of the hassle of power, cooling, or noise. Uh, kind of some quick information about our different clusters, starting with RED. Uh, this is used to store and analyze different uh, data sets from the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Uh, it's about 500 to 700 nodes. It's getting hard for me to keep track of, but it has about seven, 16, 17,000 cores and 14,000 terabytes of storage. Uh, Crane is one of our largest resources that we have available. Uh, another case of, I forgot to update the slide, but it has about 460 nodes currently active with 16 to 40 cores and 64 to gigabytes to two terabytes of memory per node. In addition to that, there's about 120 GPUs up to V100 GPUs from NVIDIA in Crane. Now we're actually working on migrating a lot of those GPU resources over to SWAN, which is our newest and actually fastest resource we have available at HCC. Uh, in fact, we actually just launched SWAN during the second, I wanna say it was the second to last week of May. And this is a 168 node Linux cluster with 56 cores per node. And each node has at least 256 gigabytes of memory, which is really great for a lot of the more modern workflows that we're seeing. There's two additional nodes with 2,048 gigabytes of memory, which is even better for a lot of researchers. There's about 14, no, 20 GPUs now in SWAN as well, since we've already started migrating some over. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, there's about 5.2 petabytes of shared storage available on SWAN itself and four terabytes of scratch disk on each node within SWAN. And this brings to about a total of about 30,000 cores available across all of our resources. 
with about 17 petabytes of storage available to HCC researchers and about 130, 140 GPUs available in total. In addition to that, we also offer a private cloud called Anvil, and this uses a framework called OpenStack, which has a very nice way to allocate resources. This allows you to run customizable virtual machines for say Windows or any Linux operating system where you need a root access. Uh, these are great for projects not typically well ran on a command line interface. They can't run on Crane or Swan. Uh, this is completely free to use up to a certain point. Yeah, basically get so many cores, so much memory to use, and then you can get another free extension on that. After that, there is a fee to get even more resources on it, but many research groups find that the free tier is still more than enough for them, especially. And then we also offer a nearline archival service available to researchers, where a copy of the data is stored initially up in Omaha at the Peter Cute Institute. And then down here in Lincoln, currently at the Walter Scott uh, Engineering Complex. Between uh, both systems in the outside world, there's a 10 gigabyte per second connection. And this is primarily using a service called Globus Connect, which we'll talk about later today and play around with. Uh, this also costs a lot less than most commercial services for backups. Uh, currently with this fiscal year, and it's hard to say, since the next fiscal year is coming around and we're still working on pricing for it. But right now we are charging $26 per terabyte per month for Attic. Uh, we also charge it, or sorry, not per month, per year. We also can do it on a monthly basis as well. Uh, we're, not gonna, we're probably not gonna be increasing prices too much on it for the next fiscal year. We're still working on determining that, but it's still a very cheap and affordable option. And it also integrates very nicely with all of our other services as well. Uh, in addition to all those resources, we provide free shared resources to all Nebraska University students, staff, faculty, and collaborators. We also have these resources dedicated and maintained by our system administrators here in our department, as well as educational services through hands-on workshops and classroom tutorials, such as the one we're in today and have been throughout the past few weeks. We also have consultations with research computing experts, both within our department and other researchers we work with commonly in many different fields from bioinformatics, chemistry, engineering, education, and many other different fields. We also provide extended computing resources offered through partnerships such as the Open Science Grid, which is a high throughput computing platform with 149 sites through about 125 institutions. Uh, we also partner with Exceed, which I believe is now called Access. I'm not entirely sure why they changed the name. But they're similar to the open science grid, but for high through or high performance computing. And then more recently, we've been partnering with the Pacific Research Platform, a national research platform, to provide hyperscale research computing resources to researchers, where uh, the PRP is primarily focused on GPU research or GPU cluster research for machine learning. And the NRP has a similar purpose, but a uh, similar purpose, but also focuses on education and research themselves. And these are two new great platforms that have come around in the past few months for us. Uh, in terms of user diversity, it's always great to see it as well. As of November of last year, we serve over 100 departments throughout the Nebraska University system with over 300 uh, active research groups and over 1,000 active users. Each month, we average about 8 million CPU hours worth of research in total. And we serve a lot of different software packages as well, ranging from OpenMPI, package development and management, Python, R, MATLAB, SAM tools, VASP, Java, R, uh, kind of a whole lot of different packages. On Crane, we have about 1,400 different packages and software versions installed. Swan is at a couple hundred right now, since we didn't transfer all of them from Crane to Swan when we deployed Swan. Uh, some of the research we've done in recent history has been in, in many different fields, ranging from the Large Hadron Collider, drought research, gravitational waves, what makes a book a bestseller in the humanities using Tusker, uh, working with the CB3 group here on campus, actually just next to our Lincoln office, on momentum in sports, as well as high throughput phenotyping on Innovation Campus, 
high throughput computational drug screening with UNMC, uh, fine arts at the Jimmy Carson Center for Emerging Arts. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the road and vehicle safety with the Midwood Roadside Safety Facility, where they do some research here at the Lincoln Airport. Uh, and one of our recent collaborations has been with the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services with COVID-19 technology within the state of Nebraska and within the continent of Africa. Then if you've been around uh, UNL or have paid, looked at UNL news from about the end of 2017, uh, we helped with the demolition of the uh, Cather Pound uh, student dorms where the simulations for the uh, implosion of the buildings were ran on crane to be able to more accurately depict how the building would collapse. And then the results are actually recorded to compare how the simulations worked kind of as a simulation versus real world test. Now it's fun to watch in person as well. Uh, so connecting to clusters, everyone should have some experience with this already if you've attended our prior workshops. Uh, we've already been able to connect during our setup this morning. And so, and this is gonna go out to the chat. How do you envision using or interacting with a supercomputer to do your work or do your research? And how do you imagine most of your interaction happening or any unique ways that it could happen? Some open source software and using a GUI on a local machine, but not running the training, uh, but running the training via command line on Crane. So yeah, uh, there are some applications that do take advantage of uh, SSH connections to be able to start things from your command line or from a local application. Uh, there's also the command line as has been mentioned in chat. Uh, there are new ways to start accessing it. And recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been working on deploying and expanding something called Open On Demand to provide web-based access to Crane and Swan and formerly Rhino. Uh, this is an addition to the traditional SSH terminal that was mentioned and that we've been using in the past handful of days on our workshop. I will actually be looking briefly at Open On Demand today, but we're going to try and share a little bit more next week about that. But we've had many applications added to it where you can run something like MATLAB, Jupyter Notebooks, TensorBoard, 3D Slicer, Rely On, all from your web browser and using a GUI without any additional setup like X1140 or doing some weird other forms of forwarding or connections with a local application. We've already done some connecting to the cluster so far today, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do that on my terminal here on the side. So just in case uh, you still need to sign in, we're gonna go ahead and do a quick little demo of it. So in this case, it's going to be SSH from your command line on Windows or your terminal on Mac and Linux, your HCC username at swan.unl.edu. It's going to ask for your password. And then you're going to select which I've, eh, whichever option you like to use for Duo. In this case, I'm going to use Duo Push with the number one. And then I am going to go ahead and approve that. And so everyone should be connected to Swan and have a very similar screen. Uh, I'm just going to leave this here as it is for now. So let me go ahead and move my screen share back. Uh, going more into the intricacies of our clusters, and we're going to be trying to get to some more interactive stuff here shortly. There is some information to cover beforehand. Um, we talked about how we have a lot of storage available for your use, and each of our four file systems serves a different purpose. And so we have a nice little scale here where on the left side we have our slowest file access. It's a lot harder to return. But on the left side is our most redundant and most backed up systems. While as we go from left to right, the speed of the file systems goes up greatly. It is much easier to access for your workflows. However, the safety, safety is not a great word, but 
the redundancy of the file system goes down in favor of performance. And so on the far left, we have Attic, which as mentioned earlier, is our nearline archival service where the pretty much only way to access it is through an SFTP transfer from the command line using something like WinSAP or Cyberduck. Uh, there's also Globus and uh, one other. Uh, our clone may be able to work with it as well. It's not directly mounted on Crane or Swan, and that's part of keeping the files extra safe by not allowing direct access to it. And there's copies of it in both Lincoln and Omaha. So even if Omaha or Lincoln were suddenly pushed into the outer space, no longer connected to the planet Earth, there'd still be a copy in the other city. If for some reason Lincoln and Omaha are both in space, I think there's greater concern than research data at that point. Uh, but it's so good to always have other copies of your data as well, uh, part of a, keeping a good backup solution as well. In addition to that, there is Home, which is the first free file system. On every cluster, this is a 20 gigabyte allocation to your user account itself, where it's backed up daily to um, another system. This is mounted on the cluster and is primarily used for important scripts or uh, management of things, as well as self-installed software. On, then there's Next Common, which has fairly fast access. It's not slow at all. Uh, this is 30 terabytes by default shared between your group. You can get additional space on Common for a small fee. And this is mounted on both Crane and Swan is actually shared between them. So unlike home, it's one unique file system rather than two different unique file systems. It's not backed up at all. Uh, this kind of goes towards that faster access, lower redundancy idea. And then finally, there is work, which is our fastest file system, especially on Swan. There's no paid expansion or no way to expand your access on work. Each group, so not user, but each group gets 50 terabytes of shared storage. And this is mounted on a single cluster basis, similar to home. So technically you have hundred terabytes of workspace. You have 50 terabytes on Crane and 50 terabytes on Swan. This is not backed up in any way, shape or form. It's a scratch file system. So it's Amos performance, not file redundancy. And on both Crane and Swan, and this is very important, there's a six month purge policy on both clusters. So if a file is not touched or used or even read for six months, it is gone. We purge it to help keep space on the file systems nice and open and help keep it fast. We have unfortunately seen a few graduate students and a few uh, postdocs who didn't back up their data, didn't have a second copy of it and have left single copies of files on Crane's work file system or another work file system. They left it there, six, seven months came by and per our policy it was purged and they came back to us. And unfortunately we are not able to recover their file because of that policy. Uh, one thing we're gonna talk about quite a bit today is please back up your data. If something were to happen to it, it's ideal to be able to back it up from somewhere else. Uh, work is not designed to be the one and only copy and not even common is designed to be your one and only copy. Um, some exercises we are going to go ahead and do. So this is our first exercise today. Actually, uh, sorry. First, are there any questions about our storage? Uh, so that way they don't get pushed off to the end. So I'm gonna back this up. So go ahead and post them into chat. Uh, go ahead and speak up if you would like to. If you have no questions, give me a green check. You're ready to move on. If you're typing, please give me a red X. All right. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is we're going to go ahead and do our first exercise. So on Swan, uh, go ahead and change to your common directory. And so, from prior sessions, we've learned you can change a directory using the CD command. And on all of our clusters, we have shortcuts for your home, work, and common directories. 
where it's a dollar sign and then the name of the directory. So dollar sign common in this case, or dollar sign work for work or dollar sign home for home. And these will automatically take you to your common home and work directories uh, respectively. Uh, these are just nice little shortcuts to make life a lot easier. So go ahead and change into your common directory and then create a text file there named bio.txt, which contains your name and your department. And then ensure you're also in your common directory by using a command and then post the output of that command into chat. Yep, so once you've made your bio.txt with your name and department, go ahead and use the command to get your current working directory and paste the result into chat for me. And then after you have entered your directory into chat, go ahead and change to your work directory. And then we're going to clone that repository that we talked about earlier into your work directory. And I'll go ahead and copy the link here into chat. I can find where I pasted it earlier, here we go. So there's the Git repository for when you have pasted your uh, common directory into chat. Okay, it looks like if you are starting to be pasted into chat. But then once the repository is cloned, go ahead and give me a green check mark. Let me share and screen two. So I'm gonna go ahead and follow the same thing on uh, screen here. So I'm going to go ahead and change to my common directory using cd dollar sign common. I can verify this using the pwd command where I can see it's slash common slash demo slash hcc demo. I'm going to go ahead and create a file called bio.txt. I'm going to go ahead and put my name into the text file as well as my department. Now I'm going to go ahead and save that. 
And then I'll go ahead and change to my work directory using CD dollar sign work. And we can even verify that once again, where we can see we're in slash work slash demo slash HCC demo. Your or your work and common directories are going to be different since you're in different research groups and have different usernames. And then I'm going to go ahead and clone our job examples repository. And there we go. I'll even go ahead and type in LS and we can see that we have uh, the job examples repository here as well as some old files from a different test. Was everyone able to saw or clone this repository? Uh, if you were, get, make sure to give me that green check. If you had issues, give me the red X. We will be using this examples repository throughout today's session. Okay, I see almost all green checks. I'll give us about 30 more seconds. Again, if you had issues cloning the repository, please give us a red X. Uh, if you're able to successfully clone it, give me a green check. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next little thing here. Let me go ahead and change my share back to the PowerPoint. Now I'll go ahead and clear the feedback. So for common and work, uh, there are some best practices and tips. Within each directory, it is suggested not to have a larger number of files. <clears throat> And we're talking hundreds, thousands of files or more. You can have different directories within Work in Common with files, but don't have a single folder or directory have all those large numbers of files on its own. Be courteous about how you are using our storage on HCC. And so, as mentioned, slash work and slash common are shared with your group. So don't take 40 terabytes of work and keep all that data there just saying around if your other lab mates need to do their research. Don't store large numbers of files since there's also a file number quota as well, but that is very high on work. I think it's about 5 million files per group. For any file transfers you need to do, uh, SCP or SFTP works very nicely for small numbers or small files. If you're doing any kind of large scale data transfer using a software called Globus is really great for transferring these large files and we'll actually do a bit of practice here in a minute. And then any data that you do have, especially the scripts and especially the source data, back this up somewhere else other than work or common and do it regularly so that way you don't lose your data accidentally or don't lose it to the purge policy. Uh, it's just all about keeping things nice and clean, especially too. Uh, in terms of transferring files, we talked about this a little bit, but there's the SCP clients such as WinSCP, Cyberduck, and FileZilla. Uh, the SCP command is really nice uh, for really quick transfers. As mentioned, Globus is really nice for the big transfers. Uh, in addition to that, you can also transfer files using the open on demand platform that we talked about, but this shouldn't be used for more than for files more than say one gigabyte, and that's pushing it in many cases. Now, larger than that, Globus is probably a little nicer. Uh, as for Globus, uh, Globus pretty much uses something called endpoints. I believe they're now called collections, where each one of our resources here at HCC and even many other institutions uh, have endpoints such as our HCC hashtag crane, HCC hashtag swan or attic. And you can even make your own personal laptop, desktop, or your lab's workstation as an endpoint with our subscription to it, all for free. And these allow you to transfer files very fast between these different resources. And the nice thing about Globus is that it has a lot of checks in the file transfer itself to help make sure your files are exactly the same from when they started from your workstation or from a cluster to their destination. 
It's also really nice because if say your workstation is a endpoint and you're transferring data for, or your laptop is an endpoint and you're transferring data from your laptop in a class or a lab, and you suddenly have to get up and go somewhere else on campus, the transfer will automatically resume when you're opening your laptop back up. And it's very resilient against those sudden stops as well. Now, in terms of getting started with Globus, uh, if you already have a UNL, UNO, UNK, or UNMC account, you can use your credentials there through the CI logon that the campus offers to sign into it. There's also a bit, the ability to sign in using your Google account, or you can create an account on Globus for free as well. Uh, in addition to being able to transfer from a personal device or from our endpoints, uh, through a license currently we have with Globus, Individuals from the University of Nebraska Lincoln can have their OneDrive with the campus be an endpoint as well and transfer to and from OneDrive at relatively fast speeds, as fast as OneDrive will allow. Uh, other institutions, the UNO, UNK, and UNMC, uh, you can transfer from to and from OneDrive using tools such as rclone, still at a fairly good speed as well. Uh, today, as a kind of a quick little exercise, we're going to do uh, some practice with Crane and Swan as endpoints, just to avoid having to set up Globus Connect Personal on our laptops today. Now, we do have some more information on our docs page about setting this up as well, and we can help during our open office hours every Tuesday and Thursday in addition to that. So for our current exercise, what we're going to do, and we'll do this together, is we are going to go to Globus and activate the Crane and Swan endpoints, and then transfer the job examples direct, uh, directory from Swan to Crane. So this is the only time we're gonna actually use Crane today, just as another endpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my share here and move it over to Firefox. So just going to use a nice clean browser in session here. So if you go to globus.org, and I'll go ahead and paste this link into chat. This is the sign-in page for Globus pretty much. Uh, the login button itself is fairly hard to see. But it is in this upper right-hand corner right here. So go ahead and click on login. This will redirect you to a authentication page where you can sign in using institution credentials like the University of Nebraska, your Google account or your ORC ID account. Uh, since I'm from UNL, I'm going to go ahead and just select University of Nebraska Lincoln and sign in with that. And it's basically saying Globus uses CR logon you agree to use CI log on to act on your behalf. You'll be redirected to your sign in page. And I'm going to pause my share while I sign in. Standard UNL or UNO, UNK, UNMC sign in procedure. And then you should see a file manager screen like this. When you have the file manager screen, give me a green check mark, please. If you had issues signing into Globus or don't see the screen, give a red X, please. Okay, looks like everyone has gotten to this point. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and activate our endpoint for SWAN. So to do that, we're going to go up to the very top right here where it says search. And we're going to type in HCC hashtag SWAN. And we can see that the owner is hcc at globusid.org. And we'll go ahead and click on that. It's going to ask you to sign into SWAN as there's no link between your UNL or other Nebraska credential account 
and your HCC account. So you'll go ahead and continue and you'll sign in with your HCC username and password. And I'll click on send me a push. And so by default, what's going to show is your home directory. So if we recall from our first week of our workshop, the little tilde basically means that you are in your home directory. You can go to other directories just like you would on Crane or Swan by typing out that full path that we explored earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my common directory. So slash common slash demo slash HCC demo and hit enter. Everyone should see this bio.txt file that you created earlier. If you see this bio.txt file from your common directory, go ahead and give me that green check mark. If you have any issues uh, signing into SWAN on Globus or navigating to your common directory, please give us a red X. But if you're able to get to your common directory on Globus, give us that green check mark. Okay, it looks like we're almost there. Go for about maybe 30 more seconds. Again, once you've gone your, to your common directory, give that green check. Otherwise, give us a red X if you're having any issues. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to, oh. Huh. Uh, are you, which path are you entering uh, in your path right here? So you'll need to use your common directory rather than the common directory I'm using. And so that's gonna be the path you posted into chat earlier. So you'll have your own common uh, path and I'll be having my own demo path here instead. Uh, every, direct, every user directory is unique to your user so you can't access someone else's directory. Uh, though if your group is interested in having a shared directory, that is something we can set up as well. Uh, that's just a quick little email to us and it can be set up. Uh, but we're, we're, what we're going to go ahead and do since everyone was able to see their bio.txt right here, we are going to change our common directory to our work directory just by replacing the word common with work. And what we're going to do is we want to transfer our job examples folder to crane, just so that way we have access to it over there. We're gonna pretend it's a very large data set even though it's only a handful of files and scripts. So what we're gonna do is we're going to click on this little checkbox right next to job examples and click on transfer or sync to. And it pops up with this little extra pane on the right hand side. And we're going to search for crane just like we did with Swan. So we're gonna click on the little collection thing at the top. We're gonna to search for HCC hashtag crane. And we're going to go ahead and select that. And we're going to sign in to Crane as well. Okay. 
then what we're going to do is on the crane side, we are going to pretty much use the exact same path as we're using on SWAN. So we're gonna transfer our job examples folder from the work directory on SWAN over to the work directory on crane. So it's gonna be slash work, slash your group name, slash your username and hit enter. Uh, in this case, apparently I still have a job examples folder available over here. So for my example, I'm going to just substitute work with common. So pretend my common directory on crane, which is shared between the two clusters is really my work directory. In your case, you're going to use work on crane. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the job examples and click on the trans on the start button at the very top. And then you should see a little view details thing saying your transfer request was successfully submitted. I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And then since this was such a small directory, uh, it's only 120 megabytes, it's pretty much going to transfer almost immediately over from Swan to Crane. If you were able to transfer your data over successfully, go ahead and post your task ID into the chat. So from your little view details pane that we saw on the file manager pane page, you should see a task ID. Okay, it looks like th three transfers have already finished. So in, in this case, Globus may not be the best use case uh, since it was, a, was such a small directory of files. But let's pretend we are transferring a whole bunch of images for machine learning or large bioinformatics data sets. And we're talking few gigabytes to few hundred gigabytes or even terabytes of size. Globus is really great for those large data transfers as it's really fast and really reliable in that data transfer. Uh, but Globus is can be used for any kind of transfer as well from the clusters or to the clusters themselves. Okay, looks like most of everyone has posted their task IDs in the chat. So we'll go for about 20 more seconds here. All right, so uh, before we move on to our next little section here, are there any questions regarding Globus or storing and transferring data? Uh, give me a green check if you're ready to move on. Give me a red X if you have a question and you're gonna type it in the chat. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question through your microphone. Uh, but are there any questions before we move on? Okay, so we have a few green checks here. So I'll go for about 10 more seconds. 
Uh, again, if you're typing, can you give me a red X or some other indication that you are typing just so that way we don't move on while you are? And share. There we go. Okay, I uh, don't see any questions in chat. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about is a very brief introduction to software on Crane and Swan. And so all of the software we have available on our clusters is are loaded by what's called modules. And these are used to dynamically load in and out different software packages and change the user environment. And so each software package has its own binaries or the executables has its own libraries and resources that can interact with or conflict with other software packages themselves. So if you're familiar with software development, especially on Linux or Mac, and in some cases, even Windows has these specific paths, it changes the path directory or the path variable itself and the LD library path as well as some other environment variables. It also helps manage any dependencies for software installed on the cluster itself through a hierarchical structure. This also allows us to have many, 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 many different versions of software installed at the same time without any kind of conflicts. So if you've ever installed your own software on your own computer before and you've had many versions of it, you may have seen many bugs come out or where software A conflicts with software C if software A is a certain version. And so as I mentioned at the start, Crane has about 14, 1500 different versions and offer packages installed at the same time. And normally if this was just all installed at the same time without doing any kind of fancy modules, that would create a large mess on the cluster and make the user experience very slow and painful. And so we use modules to be able to dynamically load in, say, Python 3.7, Python 3.10, different TensorFlow packages, or different versions of R, different, and we're starting to get into using modules for data, where we can say module load JN data, where you now have a little environment variable that points you to where we have a local copy of a certain data set because a lot of times we're seeing some machine learning data sets or some bioinformatics data sets, uh, they come from very slow sources. So if we can provide a copy of them here locally where it's already nice and fast, uh, that greatly improves a lot of workflows. And so a lot of these uh, different modules, both data and software is used basically with a command called module, it's, as the name implies. And some of the basic commands for this are module avail which shows all modules that can be loaded at the current time that can be loaded without any other dependencies loaded at themselves. There's also module spider, which is the way you can search uh, for a module. So if you want to find every version of Python we had available on Swan, you can type in module spider Python and it'll list all the versions for you. It, it would make more sense sense initially to be module search in the module name itself or the software name. But spider actually makes a lot of sense since modules are kind of like a spider web of different packages and their dependencies and dependencies based on other packages. So it's kind of like a nice little network tree itself. Then to actually load in the software, it's with module load. And then similarly, it's module unload to deactivate that software itself. There's also module lists, which lists all the current modules themselves. Uh, this is very nice when trying to debug things. And then there's also module purge, which unloads every currently loaded module, which when you submit your jobs is a very good thing to do. So that way you don't have to worry about any weird conflicts, such as with Python on our clusters. If you have say Python loaded in by default, and then you try and load a version of Python you have installed. Sometimes they can conflict with each other and it's easier to just unload all other packages and then load in only the ones you need. Uh, similar to other commands we've played with during our bash lessons, 
You can add in dash dash help with module to get kind of some information as well. Uh, we also have some more tricks with it on our documentation page, as well as our list of different packages for Crane and Swan on those pages as well. And those are dynamically loaded. Uh, if we don't have a certain software package installed, even if we have the 1500 packages installed, there's always number 1501. You are allowed to and actually encouraged to install your own software by compiling it from source into your home directory or work directory. You can also create a Anaconda environment using pre-built environments from say Conda Forge or Bioconda. You can also use Docker and Singularity images on our cluster. Though these are gonna be loaded in through Singularity. So if the image itself doesn't support Singularity, it can cause some issues since we don't allow things to be ran as root. Or if uh, software is being a little troublesome or you'd like us to install it uh, for you, you can send us a ticket at that web link below as a install request, and we can install it system-wide or for your group. Uh, these can range anywhere from the same day for the install to a few weeks if it's one with 40 different dependencies and it's from NASA. Uh, though commonly it's a few days to a week at most. Uh, it, it depends on how complex the software install itself is. And so what we're going to go ahead and do now is in chat, um, we're going to play around with software a little bit. And so let's actually go ahead and go with question number one here first. Uh, what is the software you would like to use on HCC? So already in chat, just from our discussion, I've saw uh, probably TensorFlow was one with Python. Uh, but what are some others you y'all hope to use? Let me go ahead and get this a little more organized. Okay, so we have Quime 2. Uh, what are those other out there? Sam Tools? Let's go for one more out there. So we have some kind of machine learning package from earlier in our session. We have Quime 2, we have SAM tools. So with your preferred software package, so we've seen uh, Quime 2, SAM tools, and some machine learning packages. Using the module commands that we talked about earlier, what are the current versions available on SWAN? And go ahead and post these into chat. So I'll go ahead and pull up our little table here. And I'll go ahead and just use an example with uh, Python, for example. So to find all the versions of Python, I'm going to do module spider Python. And we can see here that it says 27, 33, 34, and so on. There's also some other different versions of Python or Python groupings, uh, such as BioPython, which has some libraries already pre-installed like pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and a few others. Uh, since it doesn't mention anything else, there's no dependencies for it, which is great. So I'm going to go ahead and answer number two from earlier in chat by copy and pasting the versions into the chat box itself. So I'd like 
you to go ahead and post uh, all the versions for your preferred software of choice into chat for me. Uh, this is just so we can search for software and know it works well. So it looks like we have five versions of SAM tools installed already, which is great. Looks like we have about nine versions of R, actually quite a lot. We can even try another one here. Let's say, let's do the software the Department of Health uses for the state. So next strain dash CLI. We can see that there's three different versions of next strain CLI installed. Uh, what others are there out there? Okay, Beagle, Maft. Yeah, so already quite a lot of versions of different softwares installed, which is great, especially since some code sets work very well on one specific version that may be a little bit outdated, but still run, runs just fine, while some other code sets need the latest version to work correctly. Uh, since it looks like none of the software here required a prerequisite, I'm going to go ahead and just assume number three is no. And then for our final question, how would you load the second to latest version of the software you posted into chat? So something I forgot to talk about was uh, those slash numbers. So you have the package name itself followed by the version number for the package or for the module. So we have say Python 3.9, SAMTOOL 0.1 and 1.3, R 3.1, uh, MAFT So what command would you use to load in, say, SAM tools 1.6? Yep. So module load SAM tools 4.6. So if we do module spider same tools, let's go ahead and check the version number. Uh, looks like we don't have 4.6, so we might need to install some things. Yeah, uh, if we did have 4.6, I guess exactly how you load it, you do module load 4.6. Uh, in this case, we have same tools 1.6 available, which is the second to latest we currently have. So we'll go ahead and do module load 1.6. If we do module list, we can see we have some compilers preloaded. We have a version of Python preloaded and we now have SAM tools 1.6 ready to go. So yay. Uh, are there any questions about modules or are we good to go? Same green check marks, so yay. Let me go ahead and, yeah, I'll go ahead and just leave the PowerPoint as is. That way I can just switch to the terminal very easily. So now here's the fun part of today's session is running jobs. Uh, this is kind of why we use supercomputers is to do workflows. So this is a big important thing is to make sure you're only running your workflows on the worker nodes as jobs. Uh, anything you run on the login node that is intensive, so if you're actually running, say, your R analyses or Beagle on the login node, uh, your process will get killed 
just because the login node is shared among all 1000 users all at once. And we want to try and keep that a nice and responsive experience for everyone. If you're going to test something out interactively, there are ways to submit jobs to where you have a terminal on the worker node itself. Otherwise, you're writing a little shell script to have the worker node itself run. So we want to be running on those blue nodes on the diagram below, not the green one on the right hand side. And so we, for Swan and Crane, we use something called Slurm, which is a simple Linux utility for resource management. And this is a nice open source tool to help make clusters a lot more scalable and to schedule jobs. And jobs are essentially instructions for a worker node to complete. And this is something used on 60% of the top 500 supercomputers, including Crane back when it was a top 500 supercomputer. And jobs are assigned uh, time or in position based on the priority. And so we don't have a thousand computers to share between all of the users. And so we use fair, something called fair share to help dynamically make sure that a new researcher or someone who doesn't use it too much can use the supercomputers while someone who's doing a whole lot of research is also using it at the same time. So it pushes things around to make things look fair. Um, this is essentially based on how long your current job has been waiting, uh, your past usage of the cluster by your research group. So you could be doing pretty much nothing on SWAN while your lab mate is constantly submitting jobs that are running long, are very large, and your jobs will have to wait in queue a lot longer because your lab mate is doing a lot of work for your group. The job size is also another big factor, such as how much CPU cores you request, how much memory and time you're also requesting, and then if you have any quality of service adjustments as well, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Now, this is based off of a zero to one value as a range where 0 0.5 is the average use of everyone on the cluster. And anything above that is an underutilization, meaning a higher priority than average, while a zero or closer to zero is an overutilization, meaning it's less priority. By default, if you're a new user on HCC, you have a number uh, one priority. And as you start to use the cluster more and more, it goes down. Uh, as time goes on, or you start using it less and less, it builds back up. So it's something that regenerates. Typically, for most jobs, wait time is about an hour or two hours for larger jobs. If you're using something over 100 cores, it's probably going to take more than that, just because that's a very large resource request. Um, the biggest factor in terms of wait times on the cluster is how big your job is rather than the priority. So just a quick green check red X. Who here has tried to find a conference room or a study room at one of the universities? So green check if you've had to find a conference or study room at UNL, UNK, or UNO. Of Red X if you've never had to do that. Or try and find a meeting space somewhere. Okay, a lot of Red X's. So let's throw a hypothetical situation. So let's pretend you are having to schedule a conference for 10 people. And you need to go around campus with and find a conference room for, say, two hours. That's not too hard to do. Typically, you can find a lot of rooms that can seat, say, up to 16 people. And two hours is not a horrible size block. You can probably find a room without much difficulty for two hours as well. And a cluster is no different in where the number of people is how many cores you request and the number or the rooms are the resources available on Crane and Swan. So requesting say a, ten, a room to fit 10 people is fairly easy for two hours. But what if you need to host a lecture for 200 people and you need to do that for five hours? 
Not too sure about the other campuses, but I know here at UNL, that's pretty much gonna be impossible to do. And that's mostly because we only have, say, I think, it, we'll say it's a one in, say, College of Education, a few in the College of Business that can even seat 200. And most of the time there's already classes going on. So now you're having to fight a whole bunch of people for that opportunity to get five hours with 200 people. And that's kind of the big challenge that you face with uh, wait times. So if you need a large amount of resources, your wait time may go up just because it's harder to find a time slot on the cluster where you can have that large amount of resources. That's not to say that you can't have a large number, it's just the less you request, the faster you can get in or the more easily it is to find that, that little opening. And this kind of goes to a workflow tip that we'll talk about later, which is request only what you need rather than going too far over what you need. So don't request, say, two terabytes of memory when you only need five gigabytes of it for your current workflow. And then to see if you can split up your workflow into chunks of different memory or resource request amounts. So that way you can still get progress for your job running. And then to kind of help with this for today and the 28th, uh, we're using SWAN to, since there are very big computers available within SWAN itself, we have a reservation set up, which is essentially a block of computers available purely for this workshop. And so anytime we use the, a command called s run or s batch, immediately before you add any other arguments to those commands, add in dash dash reservation is equal to JWS 2022. And your job should pretty much start instantly since there are those dedicated resources purely for this workshop. And so that way we don't have to wait on anything during this workshop except for the actual jobs running. Should be nice and fast for us as well. But this argument will only work for today up until six o'clock tonight and from noon to six o'clock on the 28th. So this will cut, if you try and run it tomorrow, your S run or S patch commands are gonna fail just because that argument won't work. So just keep this in mind and I'll even post, type this into chat here real quick. Is equal to JWS 2022, yeah. So, we talked about interactive jobs and we talked about submitted jobs. Uh, interactive jobs are essentially the same experience that you've had over the last few days where we've typed commands in the terminal and they come back to us instantly. Uh, these are very nice for debugging things as you can kind of work in real time with things. And this uses a command called srun or slurm run is what it stands for. Then there's uh, how you get the really nice fast resources, how you don't have to even really worry about too much called that batch jobs. And these are essentially where you're creating a submit script containing commands and resource parameters and submit that out to Slurm. You wait for a job to finish and then you come back to re research completed. And this is done with a command called sbatch or Slurm batch. Uh, these are pretty much the way you want to do most of your jobs so that way you're not having to manually watch something. And they have the benefit of you can disconnect from the cluster and they'll still run. And so let's go ahead and practice our reservation command as well here real quick using srun. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my terminal. And we're going to go ahead and request a job with one node, one gigabyte of memory and one core. So I'm gonna make my text a little bigger here. So in your terminals, what we're going to go ahead and do is type in s run, dash dash of reservation is equal to JWS 2022. So this way we have immediate access to resources for today. Then we're going to go ahead and do our resource requests. So we're going to say dash dash nodes is equal to one to request a single computer. Then of that computer, we want one gigabyte of memory with dash dash mem is equal to one GB. And then we need to start our interactive session somehow. So we're going to use dash dash PTY bash. 
And then everyone should have a new terminal session open. Uh, rather than it saying your username at login1.swan, it should say HCC or uh, your username at C some numbers.swan. So if you now have a C225 or 2225 or C2226 or some other number, uh, go ahead and give me that green check. If you don't see this number or if you have an error, please give a red X. Uh, would you be able to type uh, or copy and paste the command you used for uh, the S run? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so it looks like you're missing the S in JWS 2022. Easy fixes are always the best. Uh, hmm. I'm not seeing anything about that that shouldn't work. Let me go ahead and copy and paste that and see if it looks more obvious. So I just ran the command you had there and it worked fine on my end. So that's really weird. Uh, are you running on Swan or Crane right now? Yeah, uh, so we don't have a reservation set up on Crane. Uh, we only have this set up on Swan. So to exit uh, your interactive session, uh, basically you type in the command exit, but we can do things as normal here. So we can say, look in our job examples directory and see what's here. You can see all the different folders we have. We could run Python and interact that way. And I'll play just nice. So let's go ahead and exit out of this. So we should be back on login1.swan. There we go. Uh, this, again, srun is great for debugging things and quick interactive things that may be a little resource intensive and not ideal for the login node. But if you want to be able to access a lot of resources in an effective manner, the sbatch or uh, the submit script method is the best. And so some important notes about that is that you do need to create a little script first. And pretty much this is just defining every command that you need to do to get your workflow to run. And then adding about five to 10 lines of resource requests and parameters. Uh, the big important note is that if your job exceeds the amount of time requested or the amount of memory requested, it will be killed. And if your job is not set up to checkpoint or save results, uh, you'll lose that progress. You can then submit things to the job queue using the sbatch command. Uh, you can also use commands such as sq or s account to get information about running or completed jobs, uh, which are great resources to use and we'll play around with that today. So actually I'm going to go ahead and just cheat a little bit and use the terminal so I can highlight things. So I'll go ahead and make this a little bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and go into my job examples directory into the MATLAB folder. And I'm going to cat uh, a submit script. 
So here we have a nice little submit script. Uh, basically, this just submits a quick little MATLAB job itself. You don't need to know MATLAB. Uh, this is just a nice example we used because it is computationally intensive and takes some time. But kind of going down each line, uh, every submit script is going to need a little shebang, which is that pound and exclamation point. And this is how uh, Slurm should interpret your script as a bash script, as a ZSH script, or an SH script itself. Uh, slash bin slash bash is the common one we see. And this is just so Slurm knows how to interpret the script itself. Then anything with the uh, pound sign in S batch is a Slurm parameter. And these are anything from resource requests to parameters about the job, such as where your errors and output goes to where the job name is. So if we go down the line, uh, this first one right here is basically just how many computers or physical computers you're requesting to use. By default, it requests one computer if it's not defined. Unless your code is using something, say, like MPI or in some cases, TensorFlow, I believe, can also work with multi-computer uh, or multi-computer workflows. Uh, then you'll pretty much only want to use one, otherwise it's a wasted resource. And tests per node is how many CPU cores you want per node itself. So in this case, the total is just going to be one core because we have one end task per node times one node. So one times one is one. Then we have how much time we're requesting for this job to run. And so this is essentially uh, in a hour, minute, second format, where the first section is how many hours you're requesting, where the limit is 168 hours. You then have how many minutes and how many seconds. And so if you can get this down to about how long your job is going to run or a good estimate, that's better for you, uh, simply because it's easier to fit a smaller time block on the cluster than a larger time block. Uh, in terms of dash dash mem per CPU, this goes on the same idea of requesting how much memory per CPU core you're requesting. So in this case, 10 gigabytes times one times one. So we're just requesting a simple 10 gigabytes of memory. Uh, we also have our job name here. And this is just a simple friendly name of what you want to call your job. You could call it purple monkey elephant if you so wished. And it act no differently than invert rand. Uh, it's ideal though to name it something meaningful so that way you can keep track of it. And then dash error and dash output are basically where the error and outputs from what normally would be in your terminal would go into a file instead. Uh, this is not where your image files are gonna end up or your text uh, results are gonna be. Ideally, those are handled by your code itself rather than uh, being piped into these scripts. And this little percentage sign J is a variable offered by Slurm to replace it with the job ID. So every job you submit, including interactive ones, has a little ID. On Crane, we're into like the 4.9 million for jobs, while on Swan, we're only at 70,000-ish. So if we submitted a job, this would turn into, say, serial.7981.err and serial.7981.out. Uh, this is great for help with debugging and keeping track of progress as well. Uh, just below that, we have our module load command. And so as we talked about, this is how you load software in and out uh, for your resource request itself. And so in this case, we're just loading the version of MATLAB from R2020-A. R2020 we're creating a temporary work directory for this particular job run itself in the slash temp folder on the worker node itself. And then we're just running the command to start our MATLAB script. Um, different, our different applications have different ways of starting their processes in different ways. This is just how we're gonna start it on with MATLAB today. Uh, is it possible you can explain a little more about nodes and tasks per nodes per CPU so we can choose a number appropriately. 
Uh, we'll actually get to that here in a second. That's actually in the next few slides. Uh, but the answer is we don't know. Uh, it's kind of a trial and error thing where you have to take a best guess since there's factors such as uh, how well your code scales with multiple resources. Uh, there's also factors such as wait time. Uh, there's also many other parameters that we'll talk about that you can do to control what you request or change about a job. And actually, I think that's right here. Uh, so this is kind of what we just talked about. So I'll go ahead and skip that slide. Uh, we also talked about uh, that uh, dollar sign J or percentage sign J and the submit script or in the error and output files. In your jobs, you can also use these environment variables to do different things. So like your job ID, name, the number of nodes, the list of nodes, uh, what queue you're in, your submit directory, et cetera. Those are all different things that you can have in your script. So a lot of uh, some folks do, especially when they are doing, say, an MPI job across multiple nodes at the same time, is they'll have a little thing that basically echoes uh, the node list itself. So that way, if something goes wrong with their code run, they know what nodes is running on in case that error is related to the computer itself having maybe a little bit of an issue. Or that way, if they know if that one magically runs a little faster, they can request that specific node in the future. There is a lot more variables you can use as well available online in terms documentation. Uh, there's also these little symbols you can use as well uh, as kind of like shorthand notations instead to which are nice. Uh, I personally prefer the environment variable method myself just because these are very descriptive. And Slurm has so many different single letter symbols that gets hard to keep track of. Um, in terms of, and going back to your question, in terms of defining how many nodes, CPUs, cores, and time you should request, we don't really know. Um, it really depends on your code. It depends on your data set, the algorithms you're using. Uh, the longer answer is it's dependent on what you're doing. If you are already working well on your laptop, uh, that's a good place to start is what your laptop has. So for example, my laptop has six cores and 16 gigabytes of memory. And a lot of the stuff I do works just fine on that. Um, so if I want to make it a little faster, I can try increasing that a little bit, see how that improves, see how it changes. Uh, if you're running the same workflow as say someone from your lab, they would be a good reference to talk to as well or another researcher in a different group. And then, of course, trial and error. Uh, trial and error is great also because the closer you can get your resource request to what is actually needed, the better. Uh, it's fine to go a little bit over, and that's probably even ideal a little bit. But it's, if you only need, say, 16 gigabytes of memory and you're requesting 200 gigabytes or 2 terabytes, it's going to not be too ideal for you, and it's going to impact uh, the usage of the cluster for others. So it's kind of going in benefit of both ways to be as close as possible. And then kind of taking an example from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services here in the state, sometimes it's better to request less resources to have a longer runtime but a less wait time. And so here is kind of a distribution of the time it took to complete their workflow versus the number of CPUs they requested. And so we can see here, if they request one or two cores, it takes 45-ish minutes to finish. Two to four cores, it takes about 30 minutes, and that kind of continues on for 12 cores. And then after 16 cores, it flattens off at 15 minutes. And this was on Crane using some of the, its original hardware. The wait time for one core is not too bad at all. It's pretty much almost instantaneous on Crane. While if you're requesting, say, 16 cores, it can take a little bit of time. And so sometimes there's a trade-off between do you want to spend more time waiting or do you want to do things really quick after it's started? So that is something to take into consideration. 
uh, on Swan, their workflow is to the point where it flans out at 15 minutes overall. And I think it takes only 20 minutes with two cores. So Swan has been a great help to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services here in the state with COVID-19. Uh, in fact, they have very little wait time on Swan at this moment. Some additional SBatch options you can do is you can tell uh, Slurm when to start the job itself or have the unis it can start. Or you can say, I don't want it to start until, uh, let's say, July 4th, because you want to see how fireworks affect the performance of SWAN, for example, or if a job needs to be ran by this Friday, and if it can't start by Friday, then it's worthless to run it. You can say, don't run the job at all if it's past that point in time. You can also temporarily submit a job, but don't start it until you allow it to start uh, using hold. You can also tell Slurm to not start a job at all using dash dash immediate if you don't want it to start unless it can start this very second. That's a weird one to me, just because that's almost never going to be the case. Um, one of the very useful ones is the mail type and mail user, which allows you to get an email if about your job. So you can get an email if it starts, if it stops, if it fails, if it hits the time limit, and many other different combinations. And you can basically say which email address to send it to. Some folks like to use this for to get, know when their job ends or if it fails. Uh, that way, have that you have a quicker notification and can resolve it sooner. Uh, another really nice one is the dash dash test only one, which you have to submit very similar to how we did the reservation, where it has to be that first command line argument, and you can use it to figure out about how long your wait time would be. So if I were to do, and I'll scroll out a little bit. S batch dash f tests only serial.slurm. We can say e, this job is estimated to start at 246 on this certain node in the batch partition. While if I add in dash dash reservation is equal to JWS 2022. And I even misspelled it there. Uh, if I run it now, we can see it pretty much is going to also start in the future. Uh, this is partially because the fair share priority of the demo account is fairly low, since we also use it to test some things as well. Uh, it probably also doesn't take into reservations too much. Uh, let's see. Then there's also another command that's very nice to use called SQ which basically shows the current queue in Slurm. Uh, immediately off the bat, what this does is it shows the entire queue, which can be fun to look at. So we can see we have quite a lot of different workflows running on that have been going for a few hours. We have some job arrays for things like VASP. Uh, I think this is some magnetic film research going on here, if I remember their research right. Uh, we have something from open on demand running. Uh, let's see, we have a few jobs pending. If we want to view jobs for our own user, so I'm going to just choose someone out of random. We can actually use an argument called dash u for user. So in this case, let's pretend my username is Z F E N G. It's not, but let's pretend it is in this case. We can see all of my jobs in queue. In this case, there's only one job in the GPU partition on Swan. There's probably not a job running for you currently unless you're still running an interactive job on Swan. So this is a nice way to see the current uh, state of the cluster itself. If you want to see when a job is going to start, if it's still sitting in queue, so let's see if we can find someone to pick on here. Ah, here we go. So using another username that has some pending jobs, and then adding in dash dash start to the end of it. This will ask Slurm to say when it estimates the job will start based off of the current queue and fair share, if it is pending. 
So we can see that Slurm is not too sure for a lot of these jobs. Uh, let's scroll up. And this can happen when the cluster itself is very busy or the fair share priority is very low. Uh, here we go. So we can see it here at the top it estimates that some of these jobs will start at eight o'clock tonight or at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, which not too bad depending on how big their jobs are. Uh, if you see some jobs as not started or still impending, uh, some of the common reasons are dependency, such as a job dependency still need to be completed. Uh, if you requested any specific nodes, you may see node down. The most common one is priority, which means it's waiting to get your job in because your priority is lower than a lot of other jobs. Uh, requested node not available is another fairly common one, and that's going on if something horribly breaks on the cluster and we have to bring the cluster down, that's one reason it could happen. Or if you're requesting a certain specific type of resources and those aren't available right now, that's another reason. Uh, the resources uh, job reason code is fairly common as well. As that's just saying, you have the right priority amount, but there's not a resource available yet that can take it. Such as Swan, if you need two terabytes of memory, there's only two nodes on Swan that can even do that out of the 168. And so you have to wait for those nodes to become available before your job can even start. While if you only need five gigabytes of memory, you'll probably have a priority being your job recent code instead. Uh, they're fairly self-explanatory as well. Uh, let's, if you need to cancel a job for whatever reason, uh, there's two main ways you can go about doing that, such as with S cancel, which is a command to do slurm canceling. Uh, the first way is just typing it out and then the job ID itself, and this will cancel that one specific job. So if you're like me and you've accidentally submitted a job when you try and test something or try and uh, edit a script, but you type in S patch instead, you can just type in S cancel on the job ID or if you want to cancel all of your jobs themselves uh, without having to type out every job ID for your user, you can do dash U and your username. Uh, though be careful with this one as this will cancel all of your jobs. You can also cancel all of your jobs in the current state, such as pending with PD. So if you wanna cancel all of your pending jobs or all of your running jobs with R, uh, that's another way to do it. Uh, job arrays are another nice thing you can do and are actually a very easy way to do what's known as embarrassingly parallel uh, workflows, where if you can split up your workflows based off of the data itself and then rejoin it. Let's say you can split up your input 100 ways and you've run the exact same analysis over those 100 different inputs, and then you can merge it back together. You can basically submit a job array where you take the array ID as an environment variable and have that as an argument for your uh, data analysis. You basically have to submit one script and Storm will automatically do the rest of the work for you, where it essentially submits 100 jobs as an array. So you can say, do this workflow on input one, input two, input three, and it'll ma magically work for you, which is nice. There's also dependencies to where you can say, do not start this job until job ID one, two, three, four, five has finished, or only run this if one, two, three, four, five failed to run. So there's some magic you can do in there. Um, we're not, we're not gonna really explore this too much today since they're a little more on the advanced side than what we have for this workshop. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is a little exercise here right now and kind of a break at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and change to my work directory here. So CD work. Now I'll go ahead and double check that. Looks like I'm good. And then we're going to go into our job examples folder. So CD job examples. And then we're going to go to the MATLAB directory. 
And so we already looked at the contents of serial.slurm. Uh, we already talked about it a little bit as well. So what everyone is going to go ahead and do is we're going to submit the serial.slurm script and don't forget the reservation as well. So that way it submits instantly and we don't have to wait extra. And then when it's submitted, it's going to send a job ID into your terminal. When you get that job ID, go ahead and post it into chat for me so we know that your job is working all nice and dandy. So let's go ahead and practice that and go ahead and post the job ID into chat. So we're going to submit serial.slurm from our job examples folder in MATLAB. And then when you get your job ID for using sbatch, uh, post the job ID into chat. And then because uh, this particular workflow takes about, or at least on Crane, it takes a few minutes, uh, Swana may be faster. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a eight minute break as well, uh, just to get up, stretch legs, get something to drink or eat. And I'm going to go ahead and submit my job here as well. So sbatch dash dash reservation is equal to JWS 22 serial dot slurm. So we can see a few jobs have already started. So Go ahead and post your job IDs into chat for me. And we'll go ahead and take a break until, uh, let's say 2.42. All right, so I'll go ahead and give about 30 more seconds for folks to get on back. Okay, so everyone's jobs should have finished. So what everyone should go ahead and go do is take the job ID that you have. If you type in LS, you should see that you have a serial.jobid.err and .out. <clears throat> if you open up the .out file for your job ID and go all the way to the bottom, you should have an answer down here. And wow, Swan is much faster for this example. Uh, Go ahead and write that down. Don't post it into chat, but go ahead and write it down somewhere or save it in a little notepad or just keep reference of it. And then what we're going to go ahead and do is let's copy our serial.slurm file. And let's say serial.slurm and let's call it faster.slurm. Just we're going to make this go a little faster potentially. And then let's go ahead and edit our faster.slurm file to use four cores. So go ahead and make the appropriate changes and then resubmit it to the cluster. Uh, and then I guess we'll be have that done in about 10 seconds. So go ahead and change it to use four cores. Make sure it's four cores and not four CPUs, or sorry, four cores and not four nodes. So 
So I'll go ahead and do the change here as well. So I'm gonna to go to end tasks per node and change that from a one to a four. So we have four end tasks or cores times one node. So go ahead and save that and submit that under the reservation. Oops, and I forgot to include the script. There we go. So once your job has completed with the four cores, go ahead and open up the serial.out file for your new job with the four cores, and then compare uh, it against the serial time. So post the serial time in chat next to the parallel time, so the four core one, and let's see how much faster or even potentially slower it is. So it looks like we have a few jobs that have come in and out. So in my case, I'm going to cheat a little using grep. So I'm going to do grep ANS because that's how the time or the answer for this problem is. Serial.82, I think it was, yep, 18.out. Okay, I guess it's not there. So I'm going to use tail instead. Tail dash n2. So in my case, my serial runtime was two minute or 23.8 seconds. And my parallel time was, let's see, 7.26 seconds. So go ahead and post those two numbers into chat for me. And let's see how much faster it was for everyone. So in my case is about 30% of the time, which is not too bad. So again, the time it took to run the MATLAB portion of the code, that is going to be in your .out files. So if you type in ls, you should see at this point, you should have two .outs and two .error files. One of these is gonna be from your serial or single core run. The other is gonna be from the one where we did four cores. <clears throat> Okay, so it looks like we have another one that's looks like it's about maybe a 3x speed up roughly, which is about right. Uh, just and it kind of goes on the idea of just because you add more cores to something doesn't mean it's going to go that much faster. So for grins, if I go to our faster file here, and because we have a reservation and we can go and have some fun. I am going to change it to use 56 cores with one gigabyte of memory per core. And I'm going to go ahead and just submit that here real quick. And if we wait for it, And if we wait for it. <laughs> nope, and something just disconnected from my laptop. Oh well. Let's go ahead and make sure it's actually running. Yeah. 
So I guess this kind of goes on the idea of just because it can be does, doesn't mean you should. Uh, in some cases, adding more resources can slow things down or you'll have like a little bell curve where at some point you start losing benefit and you actually start uh, losing benefit in the wrong direction. So I'm actually going to go ahead and kill this job here real quick. So S cancel 82658. Um, yeah, that kind of goes back to that whole idea we looked at with the uh, COVID-19 analysis from the state where after 16 cores, they really saw no extra benefit of requesting more just because the speed up was not continuously there. Uh, are there any questions currently? Uh, if you're ready to move on, give me a green check. If, excuse me, if you have a question, didn't give me a red X so I know you're typing or feel free to mic up. Okay, it looks like there are no questions. So I'll go ahead and finish the PowerPoint side of things. So lots of questions get asked uh, to our staff and there's a, a lot of tips that often come out of our experience from working with many great researchers. And so to kind of run through those, uh, some of the workflow tips that we do have is to test or even develop your code and workflow on a smaller subset of your data. Uh, even making your own data or a tutorial set of data is ideal. This way you can get the process down and test this either on a local machine or an interactive job, or even an open on demand before you apply it to the larger set that can take hours or days to finish. If you need to do anything beyond editing a text file or copying some files around, um, ignoring large files, uh, do it in an interactive job uh, rather than on the login node. So if you're wanting to test stuff and say Python R or SAM tools real quick, using interactive jobs is a lot nicer on uh, the login node than just running straight on the hardware. And ideally, this kind of goes on and off depending on what's going on, but check the output files from Swarm itself to see if anything erroneous is going on, even if it's not going into the actual output files that you tell your workflow to use. So if you have, say, your Python or R job spit out its own log, besides just checking that log, check the output file from Swarm just in case. If possible, split your job into multiple chunks. This can save a lot of time in many different ways. Going back to that whole conference room idea of if you can make it into small time segments or have your job be checkpointable, meaning you could kill your job and it can resume from somewhere, say halfway through the job or three quarters of the way. That is actually really, really great because it opens up a lot of extra access to resources through something on called our guest partition, which is a partition that is preemptible, meaning the job can be killed at any time. But if it is killed, it restarts as soon as it can, and it's running on least hardware, so it's a lot of extra resources available, but not always being used. And then also check uh, what resources are actually being used. So this goes back to the idea of request as few resources as possible within reason, so that way you have a smaller footprint that you have to find. Again, going back to the conference room idea of don't request a 200-person classroom for 10 people. I mean, the movie night in a classroom would be fun, but don't do it. And this can be done with the S account command. So if we actually pull up our terminal here, and let's say we do S account dash J, and then we do, oh, what's the job ID we can pick on? Let's do this job ID. Dash O rec mem, which is how much memory was requested. 
max RSS, which is the memory used, the time requested, the time elapsed, and execute that. We can see we requested 10 gigabytes. We used about 2.8, and we ran for a minute out of 10 minutes. We have, and we also have a command that does something very similar to this called job history, where you basically just provide a job ID with it, and it does the exact same thing for you, just in a much more readable output. So in this case, uh, rather than using 10 gigabytes, I might drop that down to four or five gigabytes instead if we're gonna repeat this workflow, just to make things a lot nicer on the cluster. Uh, then being a digital assistant is something else that's very important on our resources. Going back to the whole idea of requesting the amount of resources you need to finish your job within reason. This not only allows more jobs on the cluster to run at once, but it also helps reduce your wait time and open up more opportunities for resources for your jobs. So it has a benefit in both ways. Uh, if you're ever finished with a project or you're not going to touch some data for a while, ideally you would compress or archive it so that way it's only a single or a few files and it takes up less of both your disk space quota. So you take it from say 100 gigabytes down to 25 even. It also keeps the files a lot smaller or not smaller, but a less number of files, which is much nicer on our file system it actually helps keep it very fast. In addition to that, it makes it also tr easier to transfer to, say, another location like OneDrive or Attic. And then probably the biggest thing, more of a help to yourself, is to back up your code and scripts, ideally using, say, Git with a remote repository like GitHub or UNL's GitLab instance, and back up your data to another location that's not work or common. Uh, some solutions include the university's OneDrive, uh, as I mentioned, UNL. Uh, if you're with UNL, you can use Globus to transfer it to OneDrive. Uh, other universities can use R clone for OneDrive. You can transfer it to R with R clone to many other different uh, platforms out there, uh, including say Amazon's S3 or Glacier, Backblaze's V2, Google's GCP. I forget what they call their storage. Uh, you can, if your group pays uh, for an attic subscription from HCC, you can transfer it, your data to Globit or using Globus to Attic. Uh, the big thing to also keep a reminder of is while our file systems are very reliant, it's so important to keep all of your stuff backed up, both the scripts, the code, the data sets, and the results. And this helps protect against large system failures. Uh, say a squirrel somehow chews on a wire inside our battery backup system or choose on a water line. It protects against that a very, very unlikely outcome. It protects against the purge policy on work. And just real quick in chat, how long does the purge policy give you on our work file systems? Please post that into chat. Let's see if you yeah, all remember this from earlier. Okay, yep, six months. So if your file is not touched or interacted with for six months, it is gone. Uh, again, we've had some grad students forget about their files on our file systems and come back months or years later and realize they're gone. And then finally, also backing up your stuff protects against human error. It prevents against you accidentally deleting your data or a script going the wrong way. Uh, if you need help backing up solutions, HCC staff are very happy to help you back it up to OneDrive, other cloud solutions, or even Attic as well. But having multiple copies of your data is essential in research and your scripts. Um, in terms of Slurm and fair share things, a big question we always get is how to reduce your wait time. And there's three categories I kind of merge the solutions into. There's free, free in quotes, and then paid. So the free methods are, again, minimizing your resource requests themselves or splitting your jobs up into multiple chunks. 
the other freeway, which has is kind of easier, and actually we really like this as well ourselves, is if you have a journal publication, an article, a presentation, thesis, poster, dissertation, news article, a video that about something that has utilized our resources in any way, and in any of those mediums you acknowledge HCC, uh, you can actually get a boost in your priority through our acknowledgement credit system. And you basically fill out a little web form per item, basically saying, this is what it was, this is the name, these are the people, here's a link to the resource that shows we acknowledged it. And then you add basically a little s batch dash dash QoS thing in your script and your job instantly will have higher priority that you can use. We also like it because it shows the different research areas that our resources are being used for, which is always fun to see. Then if we go down the level, there's the free tier where it is at no monetary cost, but there is the time cost, which is always a big important factor where if you can split your job or workflow into multiple steps and have the minimum resources requested or checkpoint your job or have them successfully restart without issue, this opens up your job to be able to easily run on the preemptible guest partition, which expands it out to basically a whole bunch of leased hardware that may not be used at that immediate moment, just sitting idle. And in some cases, if you can split your job up even more, you can use some of the platforms we talked about earlier, like the Open Science Grid, which is 149 other supercomputers around the United States and Canada to be able to take advantage of those resources if you can get them really small. Uh, if you can get your code into, say, a Docker container or your workflow into a Docker container, you can run it on the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, it, to me, it's a fun a name because it's, last I checked, in Nebraska is not in the Pacific or near the Pacific at all, uh, but they are a great resource if you need to do GPU research, for example. Uh, the National Research Pipeline is very similar to where if you can get your code containerized, you can then have it run on distributed resources across the entire continent. And then if we take it one step further, there's the paid uh, reduction in wait time, which is basically your group. So the PI pays a priority access fee, either monthly or yearly. And this gets your group dedicated resources. So actual tied to the hardware almost resources that your group can use and share with only your group. And it's essentially your own little partition like batches. Uh, this does have a fee, I believe, currently our only CPU only resources are Crane OPA uh, priority access. And uh, that's, I want to say about $2,000 a year. So it does have an expense, but some researchers find it valuable. And this is something to kind of evaluate between, do you want to invest the time to make it smaller? Do you want to pay to be able to just run your code? Again, all of our resources are free to use. Uh, the priority access is just to have that dedicated hardware. And our staff is very happy to help you get your workflow optimized to run on those smaller resources or to get them run on OSG, Access, Exceed, PRP, NRP, so many acronyms. Uh, if you're stuck on anything, uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. Uh, reading the documentation or man page is a first step. Uh, Google is a very great resource that even we use every hour. Um, if you want help with your workflow, if you have any questions at all, feel free to drop in our remote office hours or schedule a remote session with us or email our support address as well. Uh, with that, uh, that's kind of the end of the PowerPoint session, and we're going to dig a little more into some other topics, but are there any other questions at all? I know we had a question earlier about GPUs that we can answer real quick.
So I'm going to go ahead and clear the little feedback icons. So any questions at all about HTC or any questions about workflows, feel free to mic up. Uh, if you have no questions, give me that green check. Uh, if you are typing a question, it would be greatly appreciated if you could give me the red X. Okay, it looks like we have two without green checks. So I'll go ahead and wait a little bit extra. Uh, let me go ahead and get my terminal open. So as far as GPUs, uh, let me go ahead and change to our Python directory here. Ah, there we go. So G we're not gonna dig into how to write code for GPUs in Python or how to use it in tensor or how to do TensorFlow. This is assuming that you already have your TensorFlow workflow, say on your local computer or workstation. What you do is you'd essentially just add a few extra command line parameters to your submit script. So let's take, say, I'm just going to use nano python.submit. So GPUs as of today, Crane is going to be the better resource for GPUs just because that's where the large majority of them are. Uh, we're starting to work on migrating the GPUs over to Swan to help encourage uses John Swan. But to use GPUs, it's essentially as simple as not typing the letter I, but doing sbatch dash dash gres for general resource colon GPU, all right, no, equal GPU, sorry equal GPU one, sbatch dash dash partition is equal to GPU, basically accessing the GPU partition itself. And this will immediately get you one GPU of any kind as soon as possible. Uh, let, if you are wanting a specific model of GPU, and we have a variety of models ranging from V100s, P100s, K20s, K40s, and I think even a few A100s and T4s in SWAN. Uh, you can add another constraint or another parameter called a constraint, where you can say dash dash constraint is equal to GPU underscore, say, V100 if you want a V100, or a P100, or an A100 or a T4, or a K20, it depends on what you want. Uh, you can also do a similar thing with memory, where you can say, oh, I would like a B100, and it must have 32 gigabytes of memory on the GPU itself. And you just add a little ampersand and GPU underscore 32 gigabyte. Uh, besides that, that's kind of the main get the hardware side of things. Uh, taking TensorFlow, for example, uh, let's see, module spider TensorFlow. Uh, so we have a whole lot of versions of TensorFlow installed or, or pre-packaged. You can make your own as well uh, using Anaconda, which we'll talk about a lot more next week. I want to go ahead and just grab, say, TensorFlow 2.7, and you just do something as simple as say module load TensorFlow Py 3.9 slash 2.7. So this is essentially saying using Python 3.9 with TensorFlow 2.7. And then you just do your TensorFlow code with Python machine learning magic.py. Uh, does that answer your question about GPUs or are there any other GPU questions or any questions in general?
Uh, all righty. Since I don't have a response, um, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule today. Uh, so we'll actually have some time to cover a little few extra things here, which is always great. Uh, just as a reminder, if you do need to leave early today or wish to leave early today, it is still asked that you fill out our end of day feedback survey. Like this is a three minute anonymous survey just to give us some extra feedback to help aid future workshops and uh, the last session of this workshop as well. Uh, so the next thing we're actually going to cover is open on demand a little bit. So if you go to your web browser and I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our old one from Globus here. And if you go to swan-ood.unl.edu, this is the open on demand platform for Swan itself. And you'll just sign in using your HCC credentials. So I'll go ahead and do that here real quick. Uh, and I'm waiting for my do a push. There we go. So if you are seeing this screen, go ahead and give me a quick green check. Just to make sure you're able to sign in. Okay. Sure. So the website is swan oodunledu All right, so this is kind of the main landing page for Open On Demand. There are four main areas that, to me at least, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's the files section, which is kind of a nice little file browser you can use directly from the web browser. So you can actually go in and say, click on a file. You can view, say your submit scripts. You can even go and edit them by selecting wherever change because we changed open on demand recently and updated. Oh yeah, it's this button, you click on edit. You can change it to say be, change the job name of files, quickly edit things as well, which is really nice. You can also upload files or download files very quickly and easily. Uh, it's actually been a really nice feature to use if you're quickly developing something or need to pull, quickly grab a file. But you can access your homework and common directories just as you would anywhere else. Uh, we even have some MATLAB crash dumps here as well from today. So if we want to look at those real quick, we can see that MATLAB was not too happy on my account today. So whoops. I actually need to clean that up today. Uh, there's also the jobs section where you can kind of get a little plug in the values area for submitting jobs. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let that load here. So you can have different templates for different types of jobs. So if we want to have a Mathematica job, for example, we can go ahead and create a new job for that. Uh, this is kind of a new thing that is still being worked on to try and make it nice and straightforward to use. Uh, but it's a nice way if you just want to upload your data, upload your code and push a button and start your job, it works great for that. 
Uh, if you're doing any large scale workflows, it's still best to organize your data yourself and to have your own submit scripts. You can also view any currently running jobs. So if we go back up to our main page and click on active jobs, let's just say I go ahead and quickly submit another job here. So if I go CD, MATLAB, then SBATCH, serial.slurm, then I refresh the page. <clears throat> We can see that I now have my job here sitting in queue. We have all of my different pieces of information about this job just sitting here waiting to go. Uh, I'm going to also go ahead and just cancel my job from Open on Demand because that's a button. What's really nice though about it, uh, Open on Demand though, is you can also get a shell in your browser for Swan or Crane, depending on which open on demand you sign into. So you have a full terminal you can use right here. You can run various different commands just as you would from a normal SSH session. So it's really nice if you prefer using web browsers instead, or if you need to access it from a device that doesn't have an SSH client like a university or company computer. And then the really super nice feature that a lot of people, including myself, love about Open On Demand is the different GUI applications. So you can see here, currently we have a desktop environment available. You have a 3D slicer, Cosmo, DSi, FreeSurfer, MATLAB, Mathematica, RelyOn, Jupyter Labs and Notebooks, uh, Visual Studio Code, RStudio and TensorBoard, all available uh, to basically run in your web browser without actually running on your computer. So if I want to spin up, say, oh, what feels fun today? Jupyter Lab, for example. It's as simple as typing in where you want it to start, how many cores you want, how long you want it to run, what resources you want to use, and pushing launch. Uh, oh yeah, I guess we need to fix that. So partition batch, and there we go. And it basically spins up a Jupyter Notebook as a job. Uh, currently it's still in queue. So while that finishes, I'm actually going to go ahead. Oh, it's starting, yay. So you can get Jupyter Notebook pretty much straight on the cluster, not even running on your computer anymore, which is great for development. The main thing to know about all the open on demand apps. So the one list we went through is they have a limit of how many cores and how long they can run of up to eight hours. So this is great for development purposes or we're looking at results, but any large scale simulations, calculations you need to do, those are best to be submit as a shell script on the clusters themselves. Uh, but if you're developing something or creating your workflow, these are great to do that. So simple Jupyter notebook here. Uh, if you want to run, say, MATLAB, you can run MATLAB as normal. So let's say run the latest version of it from a web browser. And I'm going to go ahead and just run this in our reservation here real quick. And so you can select different image and compression quality depending on, for a lot of our apps, you have to select uh, the different quality of the connection. If you have slower net, you want more compression, less quality. If you have fast internet or you're on campus, you can make things a lot nicer. Basically it loads a little desktop environment in your browser and you have pretty much the power of a worker node without having to drain any extra battery life on your laptop, which is really nice for a lot of folks. So here we have MATLAB working nice and dandy. Uh, you can also through MATLAB run it with a parallel cluster edition, which 
is something we're still working on getting fully set up, but it's really nice to use if you have large scale MATLAB code you need to run. Uh, that's best done through a uh, submit script itself. And then probably the favorite feature of a lot of folks is the desktop. So if I go ahead and run that here real quick, you can basically get a desktop environment straight on the cluster on a worker node. So I'm gonna go ahead and ca uh, cancel my other jobs here real quick, just to be nice on our resources. But this is great if you want a visual way to manipulate your files and move them around. Uh, another use that we're seeing quite recently as well is if you need to download some data that you need, can only get from say the web, you can easily do that straight from Firefox on a worker node, which makes things nice and easy. So we can go to say our the UNL website here and it's a full web browser, super fast. It has a gigabit connection to the open internet. So really nice for downloading data. Uh, let's see, go ahead and close that. In terms of managing data, uh, it's just like any other file browser that you have. The file paths are the same that we use with say Globus, where you can access your work directory or your common directory equally. Let's see what other things are. Some other uses that we've seen for open on demand have been uh, with apps like, say, Paraview, which is often used for 3D environments. So, if you need a 3D or a GUI environment to view your results, uh, you can load that straight in from open on demand and use it there, which is really nice for more complex visualizations because it also means you get not only the open on demand resources, but with Paraview, for example, you can have a connect to other resources on our clusters to really expand how many resources it's using. So if I load in Paraview here, you can load it up just as you normally would and load in any data you have. Let's see. Oops, go back a folder. We have a lot of directories. Demo, oh, there we go. So if you want to say load in some results real quick and I can't remember where our results are, but that's another use for open on demand is you can load in different GUI apps either ones that are pre-installed or ones that you compile yourself. If you need to ever access any interactive apps besides creating new ones from here, you can also go to the My Interactive Sessions on the right-hand side. And similar to being a, to our discussion about being a good digital assistant on HCC resources, if you're done with a interactive app, go ahead and get rid of it on uh, open on demand just to free up those resources for everyone else. Uh, let's see, I, in terms of content for today, that's pretty much about it. Uh, we kind of went through a lot of that fairly quickly. Uh, we didn't have too many questions and not too many issues. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'll be sticking around for a little bit and we'd be happy to answer them even about your own workflows. So I guess this is kind of like an open off, a mini open office hours if you so wish. Uh, kind of like an open discussion as well. Again, before you leave for today, it would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out our feedback survey as well. Uh, next week, we're going to dig a lot into the software of HCC. So we're going to really dig into modules. We're going to really dig into Conda, and we might touch on compiling software as well. Uh, but once again, there's the feedback survey for today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording since uh, there's no extra content. If you have any questions at all, please do let us know. We have a lot of extra time here today. Uh, we have a few HCC staff around as well to answer questions.